a participatory democracy <laughs> as the basis for making the decisions where that kind of activity of uh, what I assume has been a growing recognition of the importance of community as well as individual can be allowed to express itself <laughs> because it could be an advance over things elsewhere. Were people able to hear that? No, okay. No, no, no. If I can sum it up, I hopefully fairly. Uh, he was asking about the expansion of what he called participatory <laughs> democracy in Cuba and also the changes in the economic, right. the economic changes and how they affect other than social services. Yes, but a layering of structures. Okay. Well, I would like to say that I don't know if we have been successful or not, but from the very beginning, we were trying to be moving forward a revolution that on its own basis and on its own sense is particip participatory. Well, that was a period definitely that was we, we need to be uh, strengthening the, the basis of the new revolution. But starting in 1975, that was a, the first Congress of the Communist Party and also for the first time we established the, uh, what we call a uh, Poder Popular. That is precisely the basis of the institutional building and the institutional democracy of our political system. Definitely, uh, any time when we were passing through a difficult situation and we need to be collecting uh, clearly the, uh, the will of the people, we are organizing some kind of referendum. For instance, we did the, during the uh, special period, um, any particular important decision taken in Cuba, that is on the basis of the broad-based uh, consultation. Um, and we, we have the different channels on, the, on a day-by-day -day basis for instance, because the, the Cuban political system, that is not only that that is in the in our, but even the social organization for instance, that is even in our own constitution, but it's been on different levels. For instance, we have the Cuban Women Federation that is uh, the organization for women, when we have the opportunity to be consulting and to be uh, taking care of the, uh, the opinion of women from the uh, from the grassroots, uh, and we have well, we have trade unions that is the uh, Central de Trabajadores de Cuba. We have then also so many other organizations that are students' organizations, etc. Our system from the very beginning w uh, was built on that kind of basis of popular participation. Definitely, well, if we are going to the Western. A propaganda and the Western uh, media approach definitely is very difficult to make an evaluation of our political system using the patterns of uh, the, the Western democracy or the bourgeoisie uh, democracy. That is our political system that is not based on political a uh, multi-party system that is not based on political parties. But our ele our elections, for instance, you can be elected as a representative of a community, a delegado del poder popular. Uh, you can be elected then as a, a, that is a parliamentarian at the national level or, or even a, 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 a delegate a, a, a delegates uh, at the provincial level and for that you don't need to be a member of any political party even you don't need to be a member of the Communist Party because our electoral system, our political system of elections are not based on political, on political party. Any Cuban citizen can be applied now. I, I, I was looking at some uh, non-revolutionary forces. I am not going to say because no all, no, all of them have the same measure. But I'm going to say non-revolutionary forces, that some of them are considering to present themselves as candidates in the uh, next rounds of elections in Cuba. But there is no any prohibition. For instance, to be elected in the community, that is going to be a meeting of, of neighbors and anyone can present you, even you can present yourself, and you can make the proposal yourself. Definitely, uh, you, you need to have the support of the community. Mm -hmm. yeah, that, that is no, uh, and that is impossible to have a phenomenon like uh, Trump in Cuba. That you have <laughs> a, a huge amount of money and you can pay your own campaign. <laughs> but even I'm not criticizing, because I think that some Americans are backing Trump. And when some Americans, I don't think, that the American people is crazy. Um, it's, it's precisely reflecting the kind of contradiction that existed in uh, any country, any country has. But in Cuba, uh, as I told you, we have a participatory system 
that is ensured through our different NGOs that we have, through the social organization that we have in any area of society, also through the regular electoral processes, through the uh, continuing process of consultation that we are doing through trade unions and through different channels. And, uh, well, de definitely also we have the, what well, they are saying that we don't have freedom of, of press. But for instance, we have the media, uh, the media in Cuba that is public. Anyone can get access and anyone can have the same. Even the newspaper of uh, the Communist Party, Grandma, have a section where anyone can write a letter and can present their opinions. And they need to get the responses from the authorities and from those that are referred to in those letters or, or of any kind of, uh, uh, of concern that has been expressed. I think that it, we have different, different ways. Uh, that is perfect. I don't think so. I think that we need, and uh, particularly Raul Castro himself, he was pushing to strengthen our democratic procedure. That is true, that that was difficult to be moving forward a revolution. He, even myself, now I'm 52 years old, my generation was difficult uh, in some period because I remember, for instance, 1979, that was, uh, that was a process that we call deepening uh, profundization de la conciencia revolucionaria, o de revolutionary conscience. And in some cases, we have been a little dogmatic. In other cases, we probably have been no fair. In some cases, uh, that was so difficult to fight, and so important to defend our country vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, uh, the programs, the subversive programs and the hostile programs uh, promoted and paid by the US government, different US government, that we need to do some decision and in some period of time, the debate has been also open. We, we, we need to be fair on that. But definitely, I think that the, the main trust and the main goal of the uh, leading of our revolution has been always precisely to console the people and to try to, to be uh, hearing and listening different opinions, and particularly in the state that we are now, we are promoting that. Because I think that all, uh, inside the revolution, you need to be listening to anyone. I think that no, there is no only one, uh, one truth. And I think that the, the basis of discussion and open debate, that is going <coughs> open debate inside the revolution. Because definitely, we are not so naive. And we know perfectly that uh, uh, from time to time, what they are trying to, when they are applauding us, and when they are trying to, to have a leader, on, on Cuba that is going to be constructive, etc. is precisely because that is going to be the way, paving the way to the destruction of the unity and the destruction of the, uh, the that kind of pro, uh, program, project and process that has been uh, giving us the independence, the liberty, and, and this, what we call in our social society because it it's, has been not possible during this, uh, the time of the Soviet Union. That was, I think that you were, we, I, I was myself a uh, uh, getting the benefits from that time. And that was, that was quite uh, equitable society. Anyone have more or less the same right, the same opportunity to go to take holidays in hotel, to uh, the prices uh, your salary was able to be giving you the same opportunities to get access on and always our, the direction of our revolution, that was putting priority for this kind of previous neglected areas of society <coughs> and has been establishing different facilities for uh, people from rural areas, uh, people that get no the opportunity to be in the same situation to, uh, uh, to compete uh, for education, for access to culture, <coughs> but I think that we were combining this. Definitely now, there are some kind of, of inequalities in society. First of all, the, the, first, the first main inequality was that there was the idea to be those uh, people that are relative abroad, mm -hmm. uh, people in Miami, etc., that they can obtain uh, that kind of uh, revenue and mm -hmm. uh, support. That was one. Uh, well, if you will have a US dollar in Cuba, in, in we have this problem of the parallel currencies. You have a salary of a people, myself, when I was director of the division of multilateral affairs of the, in the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, my salary that was 525 Cuban pesos. 
is, 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 that is going to be more or less, I don't know, probably 20 US dollars. Yeah. If you have a relative from Miami that is sending you $50 a month, that, that guy that have no the, the need to work uh, for the state because uh, but I think that we are, we are trying to be facing all those contradictions and <coughs> challenges, but taking into account our main objective, that is precisely to protect what has been the main achievement of the revolution and the goal of uh, equity, social justice, but particularly also independence. Because for us, we cannot have social justice, we cannot have a nation without our independence and liberty. And I think the revolution was, give, uh, was granting us this, this opportunity. Sometimes we were thinking to, uh, to, uh, to doing that kind of technical improvement on agriculture to, to have more uh, facilities and, and uh, comfortable conditions for those working in, in the agriculture. Uh, well, definitely, that, that is not so bad because you are close to your house, or those in, in that kind of experience that you are referring to, the one in Alabama. Uh, that is mainly uh, trying to get that kind of vegetables and organic products to the population of the city. Definitely, I don't know, at some time the level of productivity and the level of uh, production are going to be doing, making possible for us to uh, obtain that quantity that is, uh, is doing possible to export to the, to the US those, those products, but I would like to be uh, I would like to be uh, fair and I would like to be uh, clear on this. For the time being, I don't think that we are producing enough vegetables to be able to export uh, to the U.S. Then also we need to have investment because to, to have big production of vegetables and any kind of product, you need to have investments. And particularly, we have no access to credit in the international market. Um, for instance, what they are saying, that someone is saying that we were using a political uh, we were using or uh, having a political use of the trade of agricultural products at the time that we buy a, a product from the US. And now as we have some improvement, we are buying from Brazil and not from the US. The reality is that we are buying from Brazil because we have a credit from Brazil and facility for payment. In the case of US, we need to pay in advance and we need to pay cash. Um, that is uh, precisely the embargo is affecting the opportunity to have benefits uh, uh, for us. But I think that at some time, but well, I don't know if you have a clear uh, image of what is happening, the possi possibility of trade for that kind of a small producers in Cuba to the US. 
Uh, the U.S. government is saying that they are going to buy directly from those small producers and they, they don't like to have the participation of the Cuban companies because they would like to respect the environment. For all those small producers, it's impossible to be treating the products, to be preparing, to be uh, getting all that kind of uh, trade and commercialization that you need in those products that to be able to be uh, explored. I think that there are so many uh, difficulties and so many uh, obstacles created by the environment mm -hmm. that even if we have a, that, uh, that, that was the other day an statement by the organization of small producers, no private, because in Cuba, in the case of agriculture, all the revolution we get private ownership till some limit of the quantity of land that you can know. But the quantity that was not so small, I, because I think that is a cinco caballerías de tierra, but I think that is more or less uh, 20, 100 hectares. I think that is not, it's not so small the, the quantity of land that you can own and you can be producing such a private ownership. And also you have the cooperative of private owners. I, I think that is, we need to explore, but it's, it's, not easy. it's not easy. And we have shortages in the production of agricultural products that we need to, we are working hardly, but we are facing uh, those uh, shortages of uh, infrastructure in some cases, machinery. Uh, for all this, you need to, to, to have money to buy because we are not producing uh, that kind of uh, uh, agricultural machinery we need to import. And for that, we need to have facilities of credit and we, we are not taking for the time. Okay, um, I'm, my method just for people to know, I'm gonna go scan <laughs> one side the other and we'll, we'll eventually get everybody. So, what, what is it? Okay, <laughs> well, we'll start with this corner here. Go ahead. All right. All right, so following up on Linda's question a little bit from a different angle, a few years ago, all over Cuba, people were debating whether or not there should be genetically engineered agriculture. Should there be GMOs in Cuba? This is a big debate. Everybody, when I was there three years ago almost, and everybody there was debating this. It was amazing, unlike here, where everybody was involved. So how did that resolve? I, I would like to say that, as I told you, for us, any opportunity to develop a, a, our agriculture, we are going to consider. But in this kind of genetically modified uh, uh, products, or how do you say? Yeah. Organism, we have no final decision. Because even our in our scientific community, there are diversity of thinking of that. But for the time being, our decision is not to use. Till we be affecting the health of, uh, of the people, or that is not going to be affecting the uh, sustainability of agriculture. Because I think that we need to consider our impacts. But we are still, <coughs> we have no uh, a final decision, but we, we are considering benefits and risk. And for the time being, taking into account the possible risk, we have no, uh, no uh, a final decision on this. Okay, right here. What is the progress in Cuba in the fight against Zika? And is there collaboration with other Latin American countries? Can I just say something? I, um, yeah, I went, and I went and I brought all this bug spray and there was not one. Was okay. The question is about Cuba's response to the Zika virus. Yeah, uh, we, we are, the priority we are putting in prevention. Because that is not only Zika, we have dengue, uh, we have other kind of uh, sickness that are related to Aedes aegypti, mosquito. And um, definitely, we have people that in some cases they are responsible, that are other traditions. They, also, we have difficulties. We have people that they, they have their uh, tank of water that they have not the, the, the way of means to, to get a better uh, deposit for the water. And in some cases, we are taking into account all those diversity of situations that we have. Our main uh, objective that is to involve the community, to have people, to have citizens, real, uh, that, that they, are, uh, they, they, they have the uh, aware of what is going to be the consequences. But also now we have the participation of different forces of society, including the army, that is uh, particularly taking into account the risk of Zika uh, that is increasing. And, and, and you, 
can fully understand <coughs> the vulnerability that we have in the case of that synthesis. Because that is not only the health of our people, that is the economy of, mm -hmm. of Cuba. And our access to food, because if we have no money, and we are importing a lot of food, if we have no money, and the money <coughs> is related to tourism, if we have Zika pandemics, or we have any kind of uh, issues like this, that is not only the uh, the reason for our citizens, it's also that we are going to be affecting uh, the research of tourists. And we are putting a lot of priority mainly in the area of prevention. For the time being, we don't have any case uh, that is uh, our domestic uh, Zika case. All of, all of them has been imported from people that have been <coughs> working abroad. Uh, we are doing research like anyone else. Um, particularly, uh, we were working with Brazilians, I don't know, even with the CDC uh, in some cases. I was attending myself a meeting at the, at the mission of U.S. To the, to the United Nations that was the director of the CDC. And we expressed clearly that in all those kind of, of common interests to be fighting, uh, to be fighting uh, sickness or to be fighting for health for the people, we are ready to, to cooperate. We have good institution of, uh, of tropical medicine. Uh, one of them that is uh, Gustavo Puri uh, Institute, IPK. Um, all of them, they are, they are working, but that is not easy. Uh, to have the final vaccination that is needed to, to have a, a real response. For the time being, we are putting priority on prevention. Killing, killing and <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm Susan Metz, I'm American Cuban, and I want to follow up on the theme of agriculture because I know that Cuba is importing a high percentage of food and that the production in agriculture is something that's of great concern so that Cuba can feed itself and have a sustainable agricultural system. Um, and so there are two things that concern me as an American Cuban who's lives there and works there and here too. And one is the uh, global climate change and the, the drought and the lack of water and the waste of water and the old infrastructure and the emphasis on conservation and how much uh, water is coming in from the sea that's taking the place of water that particularly in Oriente, in the eastern part of the island, there's been terrible drought. <coughs> So how, uh, what it, are the initiatives to pay attention to that so that agriculture in Cuba can be sustainable and feed the population, not export, but feed Cuba and make enough food so that we don't need to import food. And the other consideration is the decentralization, like as uh, the comrade pointed out, of um, <coughs> community gardens. And what, uh, to maintain the emphasis on decentralized agriculture so that things are grown in the community. Because we do have an emphasis here, we're moving toward grow food everywhere. That's one of the coming mantras in the environmental movement. So that we don't have to use combustible to bring in from the countryside. And I know you, there have been problems in Cuba with things rotting in the fields because you can't get them into the city. So those two things, how much is it being paid attention to, to save water, conserve water, <coughs> and the issue of the drought, and the other thing is the government support for the organic chronicles so that they can grow. Thank you. Well, the problem of the drought <coughs> is an issue that we are going to be talking with uh, God to try to, <laughs> <laughs> to have more rain. No, but you, you are right. From the beginning of the revolution, we were uh, we were uh, building dams, uh, uh, dams, dams. dams. Uh, not only to, 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 well, also taking into account the importance of, 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 of that dams for to be accessibility of water for agriculture, but also to be responding to hurricanes. I would like to say that historically, one of the main sources of water of Cuba used to be hurricanes. And that is one of the reasons that in the uh, last year, we saved ourselves from hurricanes but we were not receiving water. Mm -hmm. and, and what is the problem that is, is a serious drought issue in Cuba, uh, even in provinces, there, there, there is uh, some alert in the availability of water. 
but definitely also we have a no, non efficient use of water. We are also putting a lot of attention, but all these are resources. We are putting resources, but also attention on the way that we are exploiting uh, the water that is available in, in any area. Uh, our infrastructure, well, in a city like in New York, that you have in infrastructure on 100 years. You see that every day they are maintaining, they are rebuilding, they are, be because we have the same, well, uh, at least in, in my area, I don't know if, the, if that is going to be because it's the Cuban mission in the uh, <laughs> there, but anyway, that, that is a, a lot of efforts in that area. <coughs> Most in our city, Havana, we are wasting a lot of time, a, a lot of water, because the, the infrastructure, infrastructure is too old. We are trying to rebuild. Also, that is the problem inside the houses, because uh, to, to, to be uh, uh, having all, all those machines that I don't know how to put a pile of water. Yeah, faucets, etc. You need, you, you need to be uh, maintaining and you need to be changing every, every few years. Uh, in our cases, they are so old and people, it's still expensive to buy for yourself. And we are trying to have also a program to have all these faucets and facilities to the, uh, uh, that that is going to be cheap and that is going to be accessible for the people that they can buy and they can prepare inside the, the housing. But also in the uh, in the case of agriculture, we have channels and we have uh, we are repairing for instance uh, that, that that was a big uh, investment in, in, La Pre, in the dam Sasa that is very important for the production of, of rice uh, in in Santi Espiritu, that is one of our provinces. But I think that all, all of these are millions of, uh, of dollars. Uh, we, but we know perfectly that it's a priority for us. In the case of the community agriculture, that is a strategic uh, program. That is not only now, that has been for around 15 or 20 years. We start because we realize that it's, it's not sustainable to be producing vegetables. In some cases, we were producing uh, potatoes. And we were importing to Havana, we were importing from uh, the eastern province, Grandma, for instance, that they were producing potato in Grandma. Uh, um, definitely the land in Havana is, is quite important. Well, that, that we, have, we have a big concentration of population in Havana, around 2 million persons of 11 of the whole country. It's, it's, very, it's, it's clear, difficult to understand that uh, that is not easy to be feeding the population of Havana. And that is the reason that in some cases you need to be importing from other provinces. But Mayabeque and Guinness, these two provinces, they have good land. And they have a, a opportunity. But in the case of vegetables, lettuce, all those tomatoes, all this is, is better to produce clo uh, close to the population and not to have a lot of expenditure, not only because of oil, it's because also they are more fresh when they are arriving to your house close to the <coughs> to the area uh, of production. We have a, a strategic program of this <coughs> that we are calling uh, La uh, Cultura Suburbana. I don't remember. Uh, I, I was myself for six months in the, in the training program <coughs> in the uh, Central Committee of the Communist Party and we were visiting provinces and uh, one of the uh, one of the areas that we were controlling that is is the, the march of those programs on uh, the agriculture urban uh, that is to, to have that kind of community agriculture close to the cities and being able to do and that will continue to be supported strongly by the central government yeah 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 but also you are right we are decentralizing some uh, but this is a strategic program and that is has has been having an action. <laughs> a follow-up because for us it's clearly easy to understand that a, a small farmer, a new farmer, be, because in some cases are people that has been no previously be producing, uh, no, but has been no patient, has been no an, an agricultural person, has been coming from other areas. <coughs> we are also doing training, uh, uh, presenting technology, facilitating seeds, but for all this it's very difficult uh, still to ensure this at the at the local level. In some cases, programs that are strategic like this also have a support from the uh, national. But at the end, I think that the the, uh, 
what is going to be our objective, that is also that we are able to decentralize also this procedure because only at the local level you are going to be able to, to have effective community production of uh, vegetables and that kind of, of, of food that you need for, uh, for, for the population. This quadrant over here, over here. What percentage of the increase in income is coming into Cuba in relation to U.S. tourism? The question about U.S. tourism and income coming in from that right now. Well, it, it depends. If you are going tourism as an American, American or Cuban American. But anyway, our main source of income of tourists that are Canadians, because from around three million and a half that we received uh, as tourists last year, 1.3 million were Canadians. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that they can be probably 300,000 both counting Americans and Cuban Americans. That is more or less 10 to 15 percent of our of our total income. I, I don't have ex the exact figures on this, but I, more or less it's going to be uh, between 10 to 15 percent percent of our uh, of our total income. Right here. Hi, Diana Campbell, BTM Consulting, Education Technology. I've been following the sorry. Diana Campbell, BETM Consultants Inc., Education Technology Media. I've been following the diversity corporate programs here and going, uh, talking about going to Cuba. From what I understand, there's only two uh, corporations that are working in Cuba, which I understand Airbnb have just started in Cuba, and also there's another type of manufacturing, some type of machines. I'm interested in coming to back to Cuba. I've been there since the 90s. I've been there since the 90s to do business. What is the chances of corporations coming in uh, Cuba to do business from America? I mean, really, what is the stats? Because I'm hearing a lot of different. The, the question is, is about the possibility of U.S. businesses and corporations coming into Cuba to invest and do what they do. <laughs> I hope that those corporations that are interested in Cuba have social responsibility. Because if they don't have their own policy on social responsibility, we are going to ensure through our national law. Uh, the, case, the case from our side, we have a, a new foreign investment law that is, uh, has been reviewed uh, two or three years ago that is increasing the opportunity. I could like to say that in the past, we were considered foreign investment as complementary of our own national effort of development. Now, we realize because with the amount of money what we are spending in the social programs and keeping a, a universal coverage free for education, health, etc., that is very difficult for us to be able to mobilize at the national level the amount of money that we need for the investments that are required for the development of the country. Now, for us, foreign investment is part of one of our priority programs of development. I think that we are very open to uh, foreign investment. We have a non-discriminatory policy. I think that Americans, you, uh, you have no privilege, but also you are not discriminated. We are in the same consideration of the rest of the foreign investment uh, investors or possible or uh, we have even created some facilities in La Zona de Mariel that is a, an a economic, a free economic zone when we are trying to have mainly a high-tech investments, uh, but definitely also that is not only high-tech investment. We have a, an important port facility there that is deep water vessels can enter to, to that port. But I think that uh, for, a, for Americans, <coughs> corporation has been big American corporation already that visited Cuba. So most of them, they express interest to be involved. From our side, we are expressing clearly our willingness to work to anyone, including American companies, 
that are going to be acting on the basis of our objective of development, that are going to be respectful of our domestic law, mm -hmm. that are going to be doing a project that are on the benefit of both for them and for ourselves. But the problem is still the embargo. There are so many restrictions in the uh, embargo or blockade uh, system that has been doing very difficult. For instance, President Obama uh, uh, was expressing before the, the visit of President Obama to Cuba, they expressed himself the willingness to have some kind of flexibility uh, of the use of US dollar by Cubans. But for the time being, that has been impossible that we were doing any kind of, of transactions using US dollar. And that is because even if the uh, government express they are intention to facilitate is that the reality is that private sectors are still really, uh, they are feeling that all this can be changed, then that there are going to be fines, and also there are still regulations that are doing very difficult. They need to pass through a very bureaucratic process, and they need to be feeling a lot of forms, a lot of, uh, <coughs> <coughs> uh, responding a lot of questions at the end for the time being there has been no huge uh, interest from the side of, of but there have been so many people visiting Cuba <coughs> representing the business sector and uh, confirming us their, uh, their interest to be involved mainly for the time being the areas of work has been telecommunication uh, particularly the case of telephonic uh, uh, linkages but also tourism because if we are going to have direct flights, uh, we are going to have Americans increase an increasing number traveling to Cuba, and then there is going to be other services that are going to increase. That for the time being, also, Starwood was expressing interest to be doing the management of some hotels in Havana. It means that there has been some, some steps, but not so quickly as uh, they are needed, and particularly as we would like to, because we are in the willingness to facilitate that kind of, uh, of economic uh, relationship with the U.S. because I think that at the, at the end, to give sustainability to the political process that has been open on uh, 17 December 2014, the real meaning of this is going to be through economic interest both sides. And when we have, because the problem of solidarity, we have been having from the American people for, for so many years, clearly, the solidarity, the, that kind of friendship between the Cuban and the American peoples. I think that has been uh, the same for so many years. The, the difference now in that kind of relationship uh, can be presented by the economic interest, both sides. And particularly, <coughs> there's going to be changes in the uh, political party that are uh, getting control of the White, White House. I think that that is going to be with the business community the one that is going to ensure that can be a democratic or a Republican president and can be a Congress that have a majority on, on which of them. But at the end, the sustainability of this process that we has, has been started is going to be kept. So how do you feel about Airbnb coming in uh, on Cuba? And besides, you know, Airbnb. Airbnb. But, the, but, but this is, that, that is a, that is an internet system for reservation of a small room. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <coughs> right. so I'm, not so, I'm not so sure in that case that even we have a formal agreement between uh, our government and that. I, 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 I have no information, sorry. But in this case, I don't know what has been. I know that a private owner facility rooms <coughs> in some private houses that has been commercialized mm -hmm. through this company. But I have no, I, I, I have no the detail that this is as a result of a formal agreement between Cuba, uh, Cuban authorities and that company. I think that there has been no obstacles because I think so many Americans are using this facility. We are not putting obstacles at the same time, but I don't like to, I, I know in condition to say that this is a, a result of an agreement between Cuban authorities and that company or has been done in another way. Thank you. Right here. Ambassador Reyes, thank you for being here. The, um, I want to piggyback on that question and, and ask about how we get U.S. small businesses 
partnership between small businesses in Cuba and U.S. small business owners and not just corporate U.S. corporations. The other uh, related question is, I've been to Cuba in the past two years and I had a concern after talking with some local Cubans about some, the danger of capitalist seduction. Uh, the danger of capitalist seduction. Um, you know, desire for the American dream, given the economic challenges that people are living with. I talked with some entrepreneurs, I talked with some young people who seem very taken with the idea of the U.S. coming and more jobs and more money and I don't have to tell anybody here, the, as far as Cuba being an example to the world of living out these revolutionary values. So many of us are invested in Cuba maintaining that, right? right. Yes. Um, so how, how, do we, how do we deal with that even as we open up to more private investment? Did everybody hear that? Yeah. Okay. But I, I, I would like to say that for small businesses, and even in some time can be medium business in Cuba. That is a new, uh, is a new experience. I think that most of them that has uh, three, four, five years, no more than that. We are uh, in that kind of uh, of area. Uh, even we were no, we were not using in Cuba the terminology of small businesses. We are saying trabajadores por cuenta propia, uh, self employees, etc. Because we we are. Uh, we have that kind of reluctancy to be repeating the concepts of capitalism. At the same time, well, I think that we are in the willingness, I, I think that we need to consider ourselves how to improve the relationship between both small businesses in Cuba and small businesses here, because it's true that that is going to be probably the best part of relationship that we can have between people that are most of them real workers because when you are a big corporation, I think that you get a lot of employees, but if you are a CEO, probably you have no proletarian. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that we need to consider this, but it's, it's a new process, and I think that we need to be facilitating. It's, it's not easy, still, once again, because of the embargo. In the case of the uh, capitalism seduction, <laughs> I'd like to say that it's, it's not easy to be doing a socialist re revolution in Cuba. Mm -hmm. We were in the Western Hemisphere. The influence of uh, American culture, American way of life, etc., mm -hmm. in Cuba has been too high. Even at the time of the, uh, that we have a special relationship with the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. most of Cubans we prefer to see American films through our TV. I think that it's true that probably a, a part of the society is having that kind of, uh, and also we are naive. Uh, we have been living, most of us, we have been living our whole life in a socialist country. In some people probably because the ideological fight, we were referring always to the negative consequences of the capitalism, and we have been not doing that kind of a deep evaluation of the, we, we need to, to have to improve our ideological work. It's one of the priorities that we are, we are putting a lot of priority precisely to that kind of ideological fight because it's true that some people in Cuba are looking at U.S. in a very uh, naive way. Uh -huh. And they don't have a clear picture, not only U.S. Uh -huh. or also in Europe. No one in Cuba, no one is comparing itself with Haiti or in any other underdeveloped country. People are looking to, in some cases, and particularly has been also, and that, that is in Latin America in general, that kind of sense that you can be rich one way to other, and you can, this is that we are saying that you are going to find oil to be developed. Is there is that kind of sense that uh, uh, in some cases you, you need to, to learn to the sacrifice and the hard work is the only way to be uh, getting your, your, your money. It's difficult, it's difficult. It's, a, a, it's one of the challenges that we have. Precisely, we know perfectly that uh, the, the change of the policy vis-a-vis -vis Cuba by U.S. has been always, and I think that so many ideological uh, persons in U.S. for years has been precisely saying that that is going to be better to invade Cuba through Coca-Cola, McDonald's, 
and all those uh, benefits of the, uh, of the capitalism. I think that we have a lot of values. We have history, we have culture, we, have, uh, we are pride of our fight as a nation. I think that we have some good elements to be, uh, to be prepared ourselves and to be responding to that challenge. But it's true that it's a challenge. But I think that precisely because also, uh, but we, we need to teach, uh, to, to be uh, learning better how we can going to be able to let know to any Cuban on the benefits of our healthcare system. Right. Because How? most of the Cubans, has, they were born with all those facilities. Mm -hmm. For them, that is not a real uh, achievement because they were living all their life with all this. But we need, I, I think that we need to learn better how to get that kind of awareness that mm -hmm. a healthcare system is expensive, yeah. that educational system that is universal, and you can go to a uni university without paying a peso, and, and you have no any kind of debt at the end of your mm -hmm. studies because you, you are not. Mm -hmm. so, uh, this middle quadrant, I'm not gonna call on anybody a second time until everybody's had a chance the first time. So right here in the middle. Thank you. Um, Cuba's always presented the struggle for socialism as an international project and what is possible within Cuba has always been very much affected by the global conditions that Cuba finds itself in. So in that case, to what extent can recent market reforms be, should, should, to what extent should recent market reforms be understood as necessary organized retreat in an adverse international situation and related to that what does it look like from a Cuban perspective looking out on a capitalist world that is on life support system <laughs> and uh, showing every sign of about to go through another gigantic maybe his historic oh, crisis <laughs> Okay, the question was, um, uh, the, how does Cuba look at the crisis of world capitalism today? And the first part again was? The first part was, if Cuba's always seen the struggle for socialism within Cuba as part of an international project, right. and what's possible to do within Cuba depending uh, right. to a significant extent on global conditions, to what extent, right. therefore, should recent reforms be seen as a <coughs> Retreat. Necessary yeah. retreats in the face of okay. adverse this, Are there current discussions of a, a question of a necessary retreat given the situation of world politics today? Well, we, well first of all, to study the uh, international crisis of capitalism is, is, is I, I know a scientist myself, but I think that the capitalism has been able uh, to be overpassing different difficult periods. Uh, and I think that we are in a level, even at the, at the time that Lenin studied the, the capitalists, I remember that Marxists used to say that the socialist revolution should be all, all in different parts at the same time. That was Lenin saying that no, when you have a weak a part of the chain, you can have a revolution that was the, the social revolution. Cuba, we are a small country. We are not looking at ourselves to be the heart of any change in the uh, in the world. I think that mainly, if we are looking probably that we need to be better looking in a bigger, a bigger com a countries that have a socialist system like China, etc. But I think that for us, our small contribution <coughs> to the uh, to a socialist development and to say that it's possible to build a, uh, to build a society that is built on the basis of different values, in values of solidarity, on values of equity, and values of real social justice, is going first. Is going to be first of all to to keep ourselves as in an independent country, to keep a project of nation, to be sustainable and to be economically effective, uh, and to be preserving in that kind of challenge. Uh, the main achievements 
of the of the socialists. But for this, definitely, we need to get the control of the uh, waste of production, our natural resources, our uh, main <coughs> waste of income. Because well, you are going to say that, for instance, the welfare uh, states in the case of Western Europe, they have a very good healthcare system, they have good education, etc. But some of them, I, uh, I, I came from from Sweden. Then they have very good system, but based on on taxing. Uh, our uh, in our case, I, I I don't think what we what we are going to do. But I think that we are considering that the priority is to remain the state as a main factor of economic uh, competition and to be involved in the main economic activities that, that, that is going to be a strategy uh, for the country. But also we are going to, to introduce a tax, uh, a tax uh, system because we have no choice. In some cases that is the only way to get money to, to try to keep uh, uh, equity and to keep balances in different uh, possibilities of income as part of the society. As a retreat, no, I don't think that we are retreating ourselves. <laughs> because first of all, first of all, well, we are adaptating ourselves. Uh, that was that kind of deep crisis, economic crisis that we call a special period, a uh, period special in Cuba. That was a huge crisis yes. because we lose of uh, our economic relationship uh, and we were and we are still a, a, a country that are depending of of food uh, imports energy imports i think that we we are very vulnerable in those areas i think that the the cases of food i think that we can solve if we continue some programs but well we are not going to be producing cereals for instance and bread we, we need to, to import cereal for, for producing bread, another part of our uh, food consumption. Uh, but in the case of energy, I don't know, probably we are going to have a very uh, green technology <coughs> that is going to improve, but I think that for the time being that is going to be very difficult, that we are going to be producing the energy that we need only from the uh, green technology. And we are also going to be depending on oil in, uh, import for the time being. We are producing a, an important part of the oil that we need, that is more or less the half of the, of the energy that we are consuming in the case of that kind of uh, oil uh, products. Uh, but we, I think that we are not retreating ourselves. We are keeping, for instance, on foreign policy, uh, we are keeping our solidarity with the uh, oil countries that have been part of our solidarity uh, foreign policy for years. We are keeping on the side, uh, we are remaining in the side of Africa. We are part of the non-aligned non movement and we are very active there. Uh, we, in Latin America, we are very uh, close to all those countries that are real popular governments and have been taking care of the, uh, of the needs of their people. We are staying in the side of Bolivia, Ecuador, uh, Venezuela, uh, Brazil. Um, I think Nicaragua. In the case of uh, of our foreign poli a policy based on principles, we have no a retreat at all. I no. think that that is very no retreat, no retreat at all. I think that we are kept and we are going to be keeping our foreign policy uh, based on principles and based of all those objectives and goals that has been for so many years because. It's precisely that we have a revolution. Um, different generations of Cuba, we feel ourselves committed. That is not the revolution of Raul Castro. That is not the revolution of Fidel Castro. That is a revolution that they have been the leaders, but that has been able to be representing the Cuban people. And I feel myself as part of this revolution. Even those Cuban young generation that probably have that kind of uh, sign and uh, images of consumption that they like to have a an iPod and all this, mm. but I think that probably you put a channel of that, or a, or a challenge to them, to be referring to the, the need to be defending the revolution or to be moving to another country on the solid, solidarity campaign for Inter. We, we were part of the solidarity to the Western 
Africa during the Ebola pandemic. I think that any time when Cuba is needed, I think that we have <laughs> But definitely we don't have the Soviet Union anymore. We need to have relationship also with the uh, capitalist country and we need to have foreign investment. We are not so happy to be receiving foreign investment and to have the management of some important part of our hotels by that kind of, but we need it. We, we have, as, as long as we are able to keep control of the benefits of this, and we are sharing this benefit of the benefit of our people, I think that we are proud, even if we are not able to get the same, uh, uh, the, 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 the same practices that we had in the 80s. But I think that for the time being, we have been able to get control, uh, to, to keep control on the main sources of income of the country, the main uh, incomes um, and benefits of the country are in the hands of our people, and that are control and, and the sharing of the benefits is controlled by the state, and we are keeping in the benefit of our society uh, the, the, the main achievements ahead. And at the same time, we are remaining both. We are, there have been some Cuban doctors abroad that are paid, and they are part of, of we are exporting health services. But we have so many doctors that are not paid at all. They are, they are working in Africa, they are working in Haiti. We have more than 300 doctors in Haiti. Mm -hmm. They are not receiving any US dollar. They are there for solidarity, and we are giving mm -hmm. any time that we are able to that we have the, we are sharing what we have is our uh, our policy. Mm -hmm. Right here. Yeah, um, I'm curious, how is Cuba looking at alternative financial models other than the Western model, such as the central bank, the infrastructure bank that China has set up? This is in terms of development and stimulating your own economy, and there's also great Brazil, uh, Russia, India, China, South Africa, you know we have some problems there. And could you also, within that context, talk about the status of ALBA now with what's going on in Venezuela, what's going on in Brazil, uh, just in terms of uh, external debt, uh, internal development, infrastructure development? Well, I think that we are working very hard to try to uh, to solve our main difficulties in the case of the foreign debt, to be able to get uh, uh, to get credit for the financial system, the financial, because you know that we don't have uh, we don't have access to the Bretton Woods institution. Mm -hmm. We are not receiving any dollar from the World Bank or from those, uh, even the uh, Inter American Bank of Development. I think that the only way that we have to get money. Well, okay, you are going to say, well, they are imperialists and they are capitalist yes, institutions. Yes, yes. But in some time, mm -hmm. when you need to have an in, uh, infrastructure project, because mm -hmm. foreign they investment... Have conditions. For, yeah, okay, but foreign investment is not, is not uh, going to the direction on infrastructure. When mm -hmm. you have infrastructure projects, mm -hmm. you need to develop by your own. Mm -hmm. And in, in some cases, it's true, well, it depends that IMF, when that you have a a program of, of adjustment. But also in the case in the case of World Bank, in the case of the Inter American Bank, there have been some projects that are interesting. I think that not all of them they are terrible. I think that in some cases have been important on some development uh, development programs you are able to have a good use of the funds and you are uh, not accepting those kind of requirements and, and, and conditions that are contrary to your sovereign. But we have no access to that kind of financial institution. The only way, well, we were receiving uh, grants for Brazil, for instance. But well, that was at the time of Dilma Rousseff. I don't think that we are mm -hmm. going to get any more. Mm -hmm. well, we were receiving also credit from Venezuela. Mm -hmm. I think but that experience is difficult because those cases also, anytime when you have a popular government, a government that is uh, looking at the situation of the people, you have that kind of private sector uh, at the international level, but also at the domestic level that is going to be fighting against those uh, those governments. That is going to be, for the first day, 
trying to introduce obstacles to put uh, difficulties to uh, have as I say what you are going you can say that is rhetoric that is a war, a, a, a war economy in Venezuela. No, I think that it depends if you why you would like to use the word, but it's true that from the first day, even I remember that Chavez was in the willingness to work with the private sector. But they don't like Chavez. And they don't like because they would like to get control of the whole mm -hmm. system. And they, the only way that you can be stolen money is precisely not to be putting money on the poor. On the or you cannot if you are going to fight really poverty. If you are going to have uh, that kind of hunger zero program like in Brazil, they have, you are going to be affecting the amount of money that in the past was used for private uh, control. And you are going to be, because in most of the countries, uh, the private sector is having a lot of benefits through the state contracts. Mm -hmm. I think precisely the state is one of the main investors in any country, and you, those private sector in those countries were controlling, uh, controlling the uh, the main sources of income, and that was when you have a popular government, when you have a government that is looking at the interests of those societies that have been affected for years, you are going to have the response of the of all those that interests that have been affected because they have been the ben the beneficiaries of the control of the state and the control of the system for years, and that is that is the situation in Venezuela, even that was not easy in, in Ecuador, has been difficult also in Bolivia, but well, Bolivia has been able to, to, to have a better response and, and, and being, building a consensus that, but in the case of Venezuela, for instance, oil has been the main source of income. If you are controlling oil, you are controlling the money of the state. And if you have a government that is having that oil and that money in favor of the people, you are going to have a response by the bourgeoisie and an oligarch that for years has been controlling and has been <coughs> robbing and has been stolen uh, the, the money from the, uh, uh, from the country. We are looking, in the, uh, in the case of Cuba, uh, we are in the process of, of doing the adaptation that, that we need in our economy uh, as, as a response even to the decision that we were, that we take in the previous Congress of the Communist Party. It has been a broad-based consultation to the people to the modifications that were needed to be able to enhance and to improve the economic sustainability, the productivity of the country. In some cases, well, that is the basis for it of small businesses, because in the case of the self-employment, uh, that, that is one of the measures that has been a result of, the, of that. To be implemented, uh, those uh, measures that we decide to take, that that was not a response to the, because in some cases, there are people that are considering that there has been a measures that we were taking to accommodate and to make happy capitalist country and to make happy US government. That, that, that is not true. All those modifications and all those improvements that we were doing at the, or what, improvement or, let's go into say modification, because in some cases can be improvement. We, we are, we are testing. We are testing. In some cases, we are doing a wrong. We are going to repair, and we are going to, 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 to be in the in the right track. Uh, but all those measures that has been taken in Cuba, that was a, a, because we were convinced that has been some practices, has been some areas in Cuba that we were not doing right. What we need to have a real development and to have a society that is going to be more productive. To be socialist, but to be efficient and to be sustainable and to give economic growth, etc. Well, it's as, a, as a result of this, uh, the, the capitalists were happy. Well, it's up to them. But we were not doing this because we would like to be in good situation and to, to get a good image to the capitalist system. It's because we decide from our own that we need to have some modifications in the way that we were doing things to be able to move forward because we cannot depend anymore to have a new Soviet Union and to have anyone that is going to be helping us in the time of a economic crisis. And the, we need to be able to be sustainable and to have, to have an economic growth. Um, we are studying experiences, for instance, we were studying, uh, studying the experience of New Zealand, Singapore, some different countries all around the world to get good 
and bad practices to get experiences and to build our own model on the basis that what we are going to consider that are full response. For instance, in the case of, of taxation, we have no experience at all. We, we are now uh, starting to be doing the taxation system, how you are going to be a progressive system, how you are going to be, how you can avoid that people are escaping to their duty to pay tax. I, I think that on this, on all this, we need to learn. But I think that in the case of, the, the case of Alba, the situation in Latin America now uh, is difficult. Uh, that, that, was the, uh, that, uh, that was a change in Argentina. We have the, the experience of that, that kind of soft good <coughs> attack, a new uh, procedure that has been used. Uh, we have the same experience in the past in Paraguay, now we have in Brazil. Uh, we have a popular government that was, it's true that the last, uh, the last election, the difference between uh, Dima Rousseff and the opponent has been not so high. But there was a difference, and, and that was more than half of the uh, uh, of the people voting in favor of keeping the PT uh, in the government. And now we we, we have all those uh, oligarchs and, and, and forces controlling the uh, the system that has been spending Dima. The situation in Venezuela, uh, and well, Venezuela also had the the impact of the of the declining of the oil oil prices. Also, they, 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 they need to be facing other uh, difficulties. Uh, that is, is an issue to, that we need to follow. But in general, I think that in Latin America and Caribbean, that is a real challenge to the left forces. I think that uh, the neoliberal uh, pattern, imposition, conditions, exploitation, all that that has been imposed to the region that, that was is quite positive to the opportunities of the left. But at some time, also we have the, the uh, we are producers of raw material, and the prices of raw material has been very positive for countries in our region, because uh, that was that kind of increased consumption by India and China, that uh, the prices of raw material is now, uh, that has some challenges, like the price of oil. <coughs> now, I think that the oligarchs and the right wing forces in our region, they, they took experience. They learned their lessons. They have the support of some forces uh, in, in, uh, in the transnational capital that are very, very interested to be back to the uh, past formulas when they are able to control uh, or at least to be part of the sharing of an important income that all those countries have. I think that the situation is difficult. The solidarity of Cuba with all those processes are, are uh, totally uh, in the top. We are expressing openly our support to those uh, progressive government that have been working with their, with their people and they are trying to do uh, their best. And in our case, we are studying all those experiences that can be helpful to uh, be able to build our own model on the basis of our own needs, our own requirements, and to be keeping the socialist system, and to be doing a socialist that is going to be uh, efficient, that is going to be sustainable. Thank you. Uh, in the corner there, and then uh, we'll come over to this corner. Um, okay, yeah, so over, uh, like the last 10 years especially, we've been seeing across Latin America um, the, the rise of this term like Afro-Latino or like the concepts of Afro-Latinidad. Um, and it's been sort of like a, I mean, it seems like a response to a lot of things, but in, in large part, it's a way to sort of like come to terms with the like colonial legacy. Um, and it's sort of like conscious movement towards like uh, reaffirming indigenous and African roots that like most Latin American countries have. Um, I guess I've been wondering uh, how, how, if that development has sort of like taken hold in Cuba, or sort of like how um, Cuba is coming to terms with like its African ancestry, or like if there are, um, if there seems to be a cultural movement in the younger generations um, towards a stronger claim to African ancestry than um, many Latin Americans have seen in their prior generations, where there's been like, I I'm from the Dominican Republic, um, and 
that is a country that is very... Because we have 100,000 Chinese that, that they have been going to Cuba to be, to be exploited in the uh, Cuba cane industry at the end of the 19th century. But for the very beginning, well, we have also, uh, we have the advantage to be part of the fight against colonial control in the case of Africa, uh, particularly in the case of the uh, Portuguese colonial empire in uh, <coughs> Angola, Guinea-Bissau, Mozambique, but mainly Guinea-Bissau uh, by uh, supporting that uh, 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 freedom movement in, in Guinea-Bissau, Cabo Verde, that area, and in, in Angola. But also then in Angola, well, we, we were part also in Angola, uh, uh, backing and fighting in solidarity against the apartheid forces uh, of, uh, of South Africa that as has been expressed by I in the beginning has, has been important. I, Nelson Mandela said crucial, but anyway I'm going to say important in the independence of Namibia and in the keeping of independence of uh, of Angola, but not only that, because I think that we have a, at that time the frontline states that have been all those countries that have been expressing solidarity itself to uh, confront South Africa. But the reality in the field is that, for instance, the South, South African troops they have been able to move uh, <coughs> through Zambia, through uh, Botswana. They have been precisely confronting the, the Cuban, not only entering through Namibia. They have been moving freely because they are superiority, the military superiority in that uh, in, in that area that, that has been used. And I think that that, that was the, uh, the the importance of the Cuban presence and the Cuban uh, support to the Angolan uh, government at that time for, uh, facing the uh, the, uh, the force. As I told you from the very beginning, one of our main uh, programs and, uh, and policies that want to be more be, uh, close to, uh, to Africa in general. Our relationship, we have more than 30 embassies in, in Angola. Well, probably we are the Latin American countries that have more embassies in, in Africa. And probably in some cases we can compete with the P5, with China, Russia, <laughs> by the numbers of... Uh, in the case of Caribbean, for instance, we have an embassy in any of the Caribbean islands. Um, but I, I would like to say, well, the, the African uh, forces is, is part of our country, is part of our nation. They have been fighting. They have been fighting for our independence. We have general like uh, Antonio Maceo, Quintin Bandera. They, they have been Af uh, African uh, origin. Uh, but that was no easy during the uh, first part of the so-called republic uh, that we had after 1902. I remember that even has been some discriminatory policy to get facilities for migrants uh, from uh, Galicia, uh, Asturias, and some part of Spain, precisely because that has been that kind of policy of whitening our population. And we would like to say that Spaniards, in the colonial period, they misuse, uh, till sometimes successfully, the uh, experience of Haiti to avoid the independence of Cuba, because they were creating that kind of fear in Cuba that is, that is going to be a revolution and that is going to be independence, that is going to be repeating the experience of Haiti and the white population of Cuba is going to be uh, destroyed uh, in that sense. Our revolution, well, we had the same experience. We have club, uh, social clubs that has been differentiated by the race uh, in, the, in that kind of civil republic period before the revolution. Uh, we have a social club for white and social club for black. Uh, for, uh, in Cuba, there is very normal to say fl uh, black. I think that here in the US is African descent because we are not racist in, in the way that, that is totally politically incorrect. It's crazy that anyone in Cuba is a speak and have a rhetoric racist because you are totally out of it. Is that the reason that you are calling black and not with that kind of bad feeling? But we, we are calling, we are not saying African Cuban. For us Cuban, you are Cuban. And you can be Ch a Chinese descent, you can be white, you can be black, you can be mulatto, you can be any color. Because also Jose Martí was very clear from the very beginning. Jose Martí is our national hero. For independence, he told that the only way, and that has been a tool 
very important on the hands of the uh, colonial control <coughs> to be divided races, to try to have the unity of our nation. Our nation is one. You can be any, any color of your, of your skin. Now also, Americans, they have a program to try to divide ourselves, <laughs> to be putting money, mm -hmm. trying to create that kind of African descending organization. Because always, in our case, unity and uh, nationality has been important. Uh, on the case of race, Ma Jose Martí told that Cuban is more than uh, white, black, etc. Because he realized that from the very beginning, and in in the uh, uh, in the fight for our independence, as I told you, some African, uh, some people of African descent, they go they they go the rank of general, and there has been no discrimination. Well, but at the time of the republic, that was a difficult. Even that was uh, two wars of that they were called uh, uh, independiente de color uh, because has been people that realize that they has been uh, uh, they have been totally kept out kept behind by the uh, by the uh, independence at that time and there has been general there has been people that have a lot of merits during the fight for independence but they have been mistreated and they have been uh, uh, given in, in the as the second a second class citizen. The victory of the revolution from the very beginning, that was a clear, a, a clear a, a scope to be working together. We don't have in Cuba, in general, a organization of, of people of African descent. We have cultural organization. One of the first elements in Cuba, because our, our religion and culture have a lot of impact of uh, Yoruba, uh, <coughs> of Yoruba ancestors, well, in Cuba, you can be a so-called people that are, are, are recognizing themselves as Catholic, but you are recognizing la Virgen de la Caridad del Pobre eh, as, eh, as a chum. It means that it's represented by an ancestor. You can be white, you can be a black, you can be mulatto, but for you, it's a chum, and it's anyone the same, because the, even the African religions in Cuba is very deep, the impact to any kind of color, because it's a cultural issue. And that is, uh, but before the revolution, they were trying to uh, to uh, deny the values of all this. And some of them, that has been secret organization because they have been no able to act openly in the in the society. We are still, I, I'm gonna say, well, as a result and a heritage of that period. There are some uh, neighborhood in Cuba that are. I'm from the uh, municipality of Cerro, for instance. That is a uh, mainly an area when you used to have a lot of uh, workers uh, living there. The revolution was trying to improve one of our pending areas that is housing. We were trying, we have a lot of programs to be uh, doing adequate housing for our people, but we have been no uh, social sector. We, we have debt in that area. And in cases, uh, we have neighborhood that uh, a part of the popula is populated for a big part for African descendant people, like in my neighborhood. The houses are not so good there, but well, I know African descendant myself, but I live there because I received this from my grandfather, my, uh, my father also, because our revolution, that was a real revolution, that was a fair revolution. My father, he was teacher at, at the university. In another country, he used to, supposed to be earning a, a very important salary, and then he can be renting a good house or a good apartment at least. But as we provide the property of the housing to, to anyone, it was so difficult to be changing houses because anyone is owning a house, and the revolution have not the full capability to be building new housing, and for that reason, most of some of Cuba and the majority are keeping the housing that you are keeping as a heritage of your or a second generation that is is the one in in, in my case um, also i think there has been some programs we say that we we don't like to have a, an affirmative action we don't like to have quota system because a quota system for the promotion can be a, a, in some cases creating the contrary response that you are putting in in, in, in different positions, people that have no the merit. I think that you need to educate, and uh, our policy that was to educate anyone. 
And the, the main element that was to create a universal coverage of education, but we, we, we got that kind of becas, uh, how do you say? Special scholarship for families that have no um, people from rural areas and people from a uh, less level of income to get facilities that they are able, because if your father or your mother have no enough money, probably they need you to start working very early because you need to be part of, of and for all those families we get a scholarship to to be facilitating the involvement of any part of the society. I think that in general we are not perfect. We are still probably you have a grand a, a grand model that is you out of European descent and say, oh, please I don't, don't be married with a black. But that is is minimal. Only the very kind of private relationship uh, inside family. But it's almost impossible that anyone in Cuba publicly is going to have a, a racist opinion because it's, it's impossible. It's, you are like, a, a, like an enemy if you have that kind of opinion because it's, it's for, for us between Cuba, that is not a real issue. That is a still problem of in social and in economic area that we are uh, uh, keeping as a heritage of what we are receiving from the colonial period and then from 50 years and the revolution was not able to solve any of those debt that we were receiving. But I think that in general, I would like to say that Cuba is not a racist society. And for us, we are looking as Cuban in, in independence of the color of your skin. Thank you. Uh, we have 30 minutes to go, so I'm going to take this brother over here and pan across the room, try to get everybody in. When we get down to the last... Uh, Ten minutes, we'll see how many hands are still up and we'll maybe call on everybody once so we can I apologize myself also because I'm the responsible I speak in front. And sometimes you can talk to me. Okay, right over here. Yes. Given that Cuba is a tropical island, has the Cuban government encouraged research and development of alternative energy sources? Alternative energy sources. Yeah, I think that I, even my father, as I told you, he proved that was uh, an engineer, and he was doing that kind of research. We were doing that kind of research for so many years. We, for us, to uh, we are totally uh, committed to have a, a green economy, and to have for us it's very clear because we would like to be out of the dependence of importing oil, and precisely for us it's a priority. Has been no easy because the amount of money that you need, uh, you need to to get invested. But to the year 2030, we have an objective to to have at least I think that is one third of our production of energy uh, coming from that kind of clean sources of uh, sustainable sources of energy. Thank you. All right, this quadrant here, right over here. Uh, I recently returned. I recently traveled to Cuba on May Day. Uh, with a group of relatives of uh, victims of police brutality here in the United States. And they had a chance to do a number of visits and learn about the transformation that had taken place. One of them, as they began to learn more about the character of the police, the role of the police in the community, said, uh, repeatedly said, if we, if our families had been living here, our sons will still be alive. Uh, the courage of Cuban mothers who lost sons and daughters to the tyranny is very much part of the heritage, as they call it, the Cuban population. <laughs> and one of the people that they met with was commander of the revolution, Victor Dreque, uh, where Victor explained the killings and all of that and said, it's one of the reasons why we have so we had such a hard time sitting objectively and listening to President Obama asking us to forget about our past. <laughs> Which I commend you for the way on how you have handled that, but we don't have to hold back and say it like it is. Arrogant, disrespectful, and so forth. Now, you don't have to comment on that. Now, <laughs> one, of, one, of the visits, one of the visits that they made was at the Museum of the Literacy Campaign and they learned the hundreds of thousands of young people who went to the mountains to, to teach how to read, read, teach to read and write. And one of them asked, what makes 
What makes a teenager do that? What makes a teenager do that? Leave their home and so forth. You went to Angola when uh, the Cuban government asked for volunteers to go and fight uh, Ebola in Western <coughs> Africa. 12,000 people volunteer in three days. So that's my question. Some people says the times when the epic years of the revolution may be over. I ask that question. What makes young people and others do that today in Cuba, to volunteer the way they, they do it? Well, first of all, you need to, as you said, history is very important. The solidarity of revolutionary forces in Cuba, that I, I don't think that started in 1959. During the Civil War in Spain, more than 1,000 Cubans has been volunteered and has been fighting the uh, fascist forces uh, as part of the, uh, of the international brigade that has been created. Uh, also, as part of our history, we have a, a person, Carlos Valigno, for instance, that is of Spanish origin. Uh, we have Julio Antonio Mella, that, uh, that was Dominican, and they have been part of our uh, tradition. In general, the Cuban, I think that the Cuban people is very open to express that, that kind of solidarity and to react against what is injustice. I think that it is, is, is part of our idiosyncrasy. But anyway, anyway, I think that also the revolution, because the revolution, I think that is, is what is keeping sustainable that. First of all, we have Che Guevara as part of our, uh, our history. All of us, we have been, uh, we were educated on those principles, or those, those examples. It's the importance of symbol and the, the importance of history. And I, why is, I was telling you that it's so difficult. Even I, I can say that the uh, uh, hegemony activity of the uh, consumption uh, market can be, can be a challenge. But I think that we have values, and we have that kind of history, and we don't have the principle. Myself, I was educated. To me, that was a big honor to be called and to have the opportunity to, to go to Angola, because even so many, so many people would like to go and, and to, to, be, uh, to be part of the process. Also, that was uh, an honor, but also it depends on the reaction of society. In Cuba, you are going to be positively uh, recognized mm -hmm. when you have that kind of socialism. Mm -hmm. I think that it's an individual decision, but also it's because we are a society that have that kind of value of solidarity at the very high rank, and people are really well recognized in community and have that kind of response that you are uh, one, uh, what I'm not going to say hero because it's very American way of reconsidering, <laughs> but you are going to be positively uh, perceived when you have that, because it's, 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 it's that kind of, uh, of general culture and, and values that have been created in, in our society. Thank you. Uh, this uh, Cuban brother in the, all the way in the back there? Yes, you. Sorry, sorry. He's Cuban, he's Cuban. I know. And, and he's my very first of all, back to the front of the line. Right. He, he <laughs> sorry, because I have, I have problem with my English, my oral expression, but uh, I speak it in Spanish, please. Okay, la pregunta es en español, y todo español es No, no, no. No es una, no es una pregunta, es para, en español, eh, es decir, apoyar lo que usted estaba diciendo del tema del internacionalismo Juan, y que, 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 que creo que no puedo desaprovechar esta oportunidad que, que la primera causa ahí te voy a traducir ah no mira tenemos una traducción ah did you finish your question sí que la primera expresión de solidaridad internacional de Cuba es interesantísimo pero fue precisamente con el proceso independentista de los Estados Unidos con las 13 colonias because precisely that is a book on the involvement of Cuba in the independence, and he's a very good historian. Uh, and he's going to speak, he's going to speak on the role of Cubans expressing solidarity at the time of the independence of the US. I remember that there was a very strong connection between the two peoples, and that was a clear 
Y batallones de pardos y morenos libres de Cuba participaron en varios combates en el proceso independentista, por ejemplo, en la toma de, de la Florida, Pensacola en específico. Particularly African descendants that has been previously enslaved, at that time they, they have been free. They participated on the voluntary basis in the fight for the independence of Florida, for Y autoridades de, de Cuba, eclesiásticas, también eh, eh, cubanas también, y, y por ejemplo se dice que las mujeres de, de La Habana que hicieron una colecta para ayudar al financiamiento de la batalla de Yautown, ¿no? que de alguna manera se dice que fue la que se dio el proceso independentista de los Estados Unidos. Forces and those participating particularly in the Georgetown battle. Es una historia que se ha escrito en Cuba, en unos artículos, en unos ensayos, pero que todavía falta mucho por investigar, pero que es interesantísimo. Eh, and that is some articles in Cuba, but what is to, uh, to, uh, to reconfirm? What they have been researching it, and they're going to publish more in the future as they continue to work. Es decir, que no solo fue España, no solo fue Francia, sino el pueblo cubano también una participación en el proceso independentista como una, quizás sería la primera eh, misión internacionalista, ¿no? Ya, yeah, the liberty monument at the entrance of the Bay of New York is important because it's expressing the support of France. Eh, that also Spain, but oh, oh, eh, that, that was also Cuba, a eh, very important key eh, player of solidarity for the independence of the US. Thank, thank you. Thank you, and uh, we uh, look forward to getting that material. And I also, I, I feel bad Please because explain I... explain why that's a good thing, by I the way. I didn't... Suppression I, excuse, of the excuse me, sir. Florida. Excuse me. And I, I didn't... Uh, I didn't warn our guest that he would have to do translating. <laughs> okay, uh, right over here. Um, the, uh, the solidarity of Cuba showed... Okay. Uh, the solidarity Cuba showed internationally, especially to Africa, came at a great cost to the Cuban people. And the same thing with the uh, ideological purity, kind of maintaining your principles, it also came at a great cost. Uh, and Cuba was punished for, for supporting Africa, severely punished. And uh, the whole solidarity thing, uh, somebody said to me, in Latin America, everybody raises their hat to Cuba, but nobody wants to wear the Cuban hat. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's, what have you learned from this whole experience? I know it's important to stay the course, but it has also cost the Cuban people tremendously. So what are kind of the internal lessons from that have been learned from this going forward? No, I, I think that first of all is is part of the duty that we have with the African people that we need to but also I you are totally right. Also there have been some learns, uh, some lessons that we learn from that because there is a cherry process when you are helping but also you are getting from uh, from those countries. For instance, that has been very important for us because we, for instance, in the case of doctors, in the case of the technical area, our doctors have been trained in those kind of, in kind of sicknesses that disappear. That has been, uh, for instance, malaria, some, uh, some sickness that in Cuba pandemic, that in Cuba disappeared for years. Our doctors get the experience of that work. In general, as I told you, uh, that was a, an important recognition, and you get a lot of social merit in society when you have that kind of experience to be part, of, and when you are uh, involved on, on this. I think that is, is helping us on social cohesion, is helping us on to be learning, because in some cases, to be expressing solidarity is not only in Africa and in Latin America, that is also in the rural area in Cuba, you have uh, areas in the mountains that doctors don't like to be working because it's very normal. But I think that is why you are asking a doctor to go 
to those places, they have, uh, they are going to be ashamed if they are not going to be responding positively. Because if they have some comrades that are able to go to be fighting Ebola, etc., how you are not going to be doing the same, even inside your country, are to be responding to the need of your own people. I think that in general, it's in that kind of uh, a two-way relationship that when we are learning, but also that has been very positive for that kind of sense of community and, 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 and common sharing that we develop has been very important for Inda during the time of the crisis of the special period, that we have a lot of shortages. And the inside solidarity of family, community, has been very important to be facing. The shortages, the blackout, a lack of electricity, and in some cases, even shortages of sugar, salt, that people were sharing that probably you, you are not consuming bigger amount of sugar, but you are, I'm giving you sugar, and you are giving me at the retained black beans, and that kind of experience that I did. Okay, we got 15 minutes left, so I'm gonna try to take all of, uh, a number of questions, and then uh, try to keep your question comment to one minute. So we're gonna go around the room real quick. Start with John. Let, let me add another connection. The Felix Varela, Father Felix Varela, who was forced into exile because of his opposition to slavery and colonialism, came to New York and became the primary advocate for the famine Irish when they were arriving in New York. So there's a very close, all right, two questions. If I understood you properly, when you were talking about the currency, the dollar use, you were saying, and the State Department would say in the last OFAC iteration that they tried to solve the problem. Were you saying that you thought they acted in good faith, but the bureaucratic obstacles were too great, or have to be, that there needs to be another further iteration of the regulatory question in order for that to can you keep? Yeah. Can you keep just to the one question? Yeah, 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 yeah. I want to take a few now. Okay. We we'll take a couple of questions yes. in the middle, and then uh, in the back. Quick. Okay. You. Yeah. You. Okay. Um, I wanted to know, um, as a Canadian, we watch closely the American elections because whoever will be elected deeply affects uh, not only the U.S. people but everybody in the world. So I want to know how you see the future of. Uh, Cuban relations with the U.S. according to who would be elected. Let's just say Trump would be elected. Bro brother right here. Uh, based on Cuba's experience standing alongside and fighting with Africans against colonialism, uh, how does Cuba view today's uprisings and the resistance yeah, that is cropping up in various parts of Africa, from Algeria to Chad, to Nigeria, to East Africa, Somalia, which the Western countries characterize as terrorism. Okay, those three questions. Dollar currency, U.S. Cuba. Terrorism. Okay, then we'll take three more. We got uh, 10 minutes. Okay, uh, they, on the good faith, I think that is is going to win for us. We are working with, with the U.S. government on that kind of, of process of bilateral relationship. We are assuming that they are acting in good faith. And they uh, they spoke publicly on their willingness to allow that kind of flexibility. But the reality is the embargo, the blockade, is still providing so many obstacles and difficulties that is making impossible that kind of transaction. Is, I think that is not bureaucratic only. I think that is mainly that kind of measures that are still in place as part of the embargo that are depriving uh, or are, are keeping very cautiously, uh, a cautious position, the, the different banks. And particularly, even the most of, of the third country banks, they need to be passing one way or another through US. And, and for the time being, it has been not able. But I, 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 I have no any elements not to recognize the good faith of U.S. government on this. In the case of the impact of the elections, well, if we make uh, the, the, uh, the analysis that that was Obama and that was a democratic administration, the one that took the, the decision to uh, reestablish the diplomatic relations and is working, I think that 
I think that is, is no doubt that it's going to say that we have the, the, the perception that it's going to be a democratic government is going to be better to be keeping track. On the speed of the process, we have some doubt because I think that Obama himself put a, a lot of uh, enthusiast, uh, enthusiasm and a lot of political capital on this. And probably even the process can be a slow down. Mm. But, well, let's go to, to check. But the, I think that it's going to be more positively in the side of um, a, a democratic president. In the case of Trump or, or Robert Republican president, I think that it's going to be very difficult to be back to the situation before 17 December. But definitely can be introduced important obstacles to the uh, uh, speed of the process and even can be uh, in some areas establish some obstacles to what we are obtaining a uh, uh, in, well, in a sense, I think that it's going to be better a democratic uh, president, but well, it's all to the uh, US people to decide yes, who your president is going to be. <laughs> in the case of <laughs> African politics, I think that we are trying to keep a good relationship, and we are, in the case of voting in the UN, most of our votes, the votes and support that we receive, are coming from Africa. I think that we, they are, uh, is two sides solidarity. We are expressing solidarity to them, but also they are expressing a lot of solidarity to Cuba. They are asking clearly, uh, requesting the end of the embargo, the, the US blockade of Cuba. Uh, they are uh, backing us in other uh, fields, even in the fight when the US was trying to, uh, well, was trying not. They did for 20 years. They imposed a resolution against Cuba in the Human Rights Council, well, the Commission on Human Rights, and we were receiving the support of Africa against that attempt uh, from the US. I think that is so, so many areas. We are keeping good relationship, and we are, I, I think, I, I didn't understand clearly the part of terrorism, etc. but we have a very clear policy against That's terrorism, and we are going to be part of an international effort to fight terrorism. Thank you. Okay, um, let's take these three right here and uh, quickly ask the question, keep it left in a minute, and then these will be the last. How many people other than these three uh, that haven't spoken yet, but I'll, okay, so one more. Four, and quickly, okay. Um, could and I very start? quick, you, you, and you. Um, I hope you're familiar with AfroCubaWeb.com. If not, I think it's a very good way for people whose questions were being asked about that heritage. And I hope that this beautiful gentleman's work will be able to go to your country because you can see picture the homeless and that would show the young people especially how you go to 31st Street and you'll see people laying out in the street. The thing I was thinking was the bigger question is, what is our responsibility to press our president in the U.S. to do more now while in power, to continue to open the uh, blockade and, for example, allow the percentages of how much trade can be uh, from Europe to Cuba and then they can come to the U.S.? Even just the percentage might be something people need to know. Thank you. Thank you. Brother here, quickly. Uh, my, my question regarding Cuba's Foreign policy toward the Middle East and in, in Syria now there's a Kurdish left. Syria, Syria. Syria. Syrian Kurds, they are kind of representing the left. And I was wondering if if Cuban has any relationship with them, are they helping them? Are they doing any solidarity with them? You know, Question is about the Syria, the war in Syria. Quickly, brother. Yep. It's my understanding that a lot of the leadership in the, in the sciences and uh, engineering in Cuba is, is women. Um, and I'm wondering um, what sort of flavor women have brought to scientific advancement in Cuba, um, and if you have any advice for uh, these struggles in the United States, where a lot of leadership is actually is male dominated, um, what kinds of things uh, would you suggest um, doing in the United States to advance? Uh, Thirty seconds each. Oh, please last two. Okay. And then we'll take I know it. we've been questioning Cuba about all kinds of issues about Cuba, but. We're at the Socialist Forum, and you have so much to teach us about socialism. Four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> what is the Cuban government doing here in the U.S. to eliminate the myth the Obama administration continues to perpetuate about the lack of human rights in Cuba? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. okay. so, you, 
got all of those? <laughs> I think that Obama, uh, uh, to, to leave the embargo or the blockade, is, is only possible through the Congress. Uh, but I think that Obama can be doing a, a, a lot for Indians to keep uh, to introduce more flexibility in the case of freedom to travel. If the Americans have more opportunity to go there, they are going to, to, to be uh, looking the, the truth in what, what is the real situation in Cuba, what's Cuba. I think that mainly and in the economic area, to facilitate more trade in agriculture uh, and to, uh, to uh, but I, in, in this, I, I think there is a lot of, but, but particularly freedom to travel is, is going to be uh, an important, an important element. In the case of Syria, well, and Kurdistan, we have a lot of relationships, traditional relationships through political parties, because there is a lot of socialist and communist organization from Kurdistan. And traditionally, we were having good relationships with those uh, and we, we have a lot of respect for what uh, the court people is doing and what has been the important fight for, for years. And in that sense, I think that is, is clear. On the case of, of uh, opinion and what we can tell for, for women, but I think that is, is difficult. I think that in that case, uh, we, we, we probably ask very to the Cuban Women Federation because they are our national machinery, but in general, I think that women in general that are better in so many areas of administration and, and giving, giving control. But particularly, I think that it's very important to get facility for women because women are going to be facing difficulties at the time uh, of uh, taking responsibilities in the house, in the family. I think that you need to be getting a lot of social facilities you need to be for to be taking care of children and to be provided and also our legislature is very protective on the right of women and on their right to preserve their uh, their employment. Uh, for instance, you, you can be staying at house for one year and then you can get half of your salary a salary uh, if you are a woman for another six months and you are not going to lose your employment. I think that there are so many issues, but particularly that is the respect for women, that in Cuba is very clear. And we are looking at women as uh, with the same rights, and they, if they, they, they have a lot of merits, um, and we, we need to recognize this, and they are recognized through a vote uh, in so many processes in Cuba. To these socialists, and I want <laughs> to deal with <laughs> <laughs> I think that I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be able. I'm not going to be able. <laughs> and particularly because most of you, you know, uh, most, uh, you, you know better than me what are the basis of Marxism and what are the basis of the economy. But I think that the difference in some cases is to take the right decision on practice. Because I think that academics is one issue and to be doing things in the field is another one. I think that the merit of Cuba has been to try to be learning anytime, to be adaptation as necessary, and to be keeping what is the essence. And the essence is the control of, of the fundamental uh, means of production, but also the control of power. And our political system was built on the basis of a socialist society and that is so difficult that is if you are going to make the evaluation of Cuba as a democracy, if you are using the tools of the Western uh, democracy or, or the bourgeois uh, democracy. Because I think that the, if you have a, a state, a political system, an, eco an economy that is based on the interests of, uh, of the people, you can do, be doing mistakes. I, I think that we are doing a lot of mistakes, but at the end you are keeping control and you are able to reparate, you are able to repair, you are able to be back and to solve all those issues that you were doing wrongly. And at the end, I think that at the end, the main sense to, to keep the economic tools, the control of natural resources, the main uh, areas of, uh, of, uh, of the economy, but also the political system. I think that the political system needs to be built on the basis because I think that the capitalism was presenting their own political system precisely to defend and to ensure. That is, a, that is what is happening in Alba that it's very difficult to be doing a defiance and to be, a, to be challenging the system, keeping the tools of a system that has been built.
precisely to protect and to defend the interests of capital. Um, I think that, what, that, that is a, the difference. That was into a real revolution. That was a real process of, uh, of change um, and transformation on the benefit of our people. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, what we are doing, what we are doing to defend our own truth, the reality of the enjoyment of human rights in Cuba, is not easy. It's not easy inside the U.S. when you have the control of the media by the uh, the capital. I, a so-called independent New Times at the time when that was the Obama administration preparing itself for the change of policy. You saw that have been around six editorial dealing positively on Cuba. Right. But out of this, you have most of the time the media, anyone, doing propaganda again precisely because for US, for Europe, for the uh, uh, for the capitalism, Cuba is a challenge. It's a different society. And they never going to accept that a society like this that is deprived the control and the hegemony of or, or the tools of control of capitalism. And what we are doing, we are trying to be talking with good people like you. We are trying to be speaking at the universities. We are trying to, well, first of all, at the UN, we were able to defeat the uh, exercise of human rights. They, when the Human Rights Council was created, that was only possible. You know why the Commission of Human Rights was destroyed? Because for the first time, Cuba, in, in the year 2005, took the decision to present a draft resolution trying to, to ask the end of the uh, center of torture in Guantanamo Bay. Um, America, uh, America, they thought that that is impossible to suffer uh, an organ of the UN uh, making that kind of, uh, uh, of humiliation to the superpower. But well, they have a wrong, they have a wrong evaluation. They thought that they can create a new body that was the Human Rights Council. That is going to be under their control. But the Human Rights Council was with the, uh, we were able to be working with Asia, Africa, and so many Latin Americans. And for instance, it's the only body in the UN that have an unequitable geographical representation. On a body of 47 uh, members, you have 15 members of Africa. And definitely with a new composition, it's impossible for the US government to impose that kind of manipulation against you. It's, it's difficult because even at the personal level, ideologically, I think that the, uh, uh, the hegemonic, uh, hegemonic power has been very successful to try to enforce that kind of sense of perception of, of what they consider freedom of opinion, mm. freedom of information, what they call freedom of association. For them, that is, but that is not true. Uh, that is not only model, that, not, that is not only way to be interpreting and to be enjoying, enjoying and, and fulfilling that kind of, of uh, of human rights. Probably, uh, in some cases, we have some particular decision that we took to defend our sovereignty and to defend vis-a-vis -vis the, the hostile policy of the U.S. But in general, I think that we educate our people. We have the mass media uh, 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 in the hands of our people. We have our uh, university, of our areas to discuss openly ideas on behalf of our people. I think that we have a real environment for fulfilling on civil and political rights. Mm -hmm. um, but in that case, I, I openly uh, ready to discuss, because I myself an expert of human rights. I was working, uh, I was attending the Commission on Human Rights for more than 15 years. And then the Human Rights Council, I was ambassador in Geneva and vice president of the Human Rights Council. But the main problem is that they have been very successful to impose one model of democracy. And most of the people all around the world consider that their values is the only values. 
and I'm the only model that is real dem democratic. But we need to start explaining what we are, how we are doing in Cuba and what are the real capabilities of the Cuban to speak freely and to uh, associate freely and to participate uh, freely in, in the conduction of our, of our businesses, in the conduction of our law. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, all of you, for your participation.